more people will come. As you know, the last session just took much more time than expected, and people are still enjoying their teas. Uh, but I think that uh, it, it will be better to start because otherwise we are not going to finish uh, on time. Okay, so as a matter of introduction, let me first uh, say that this session is a follow-up of a similar session that took place in, uh, in the last edition of ICAS, the seven ICAS in Rome in 2016. There, we were basically debating what were the main uh, challenges on measuring food losses. As you know, measuring food losses is a very challenging task, okay? Because uh, uh, measuring food losses entails measuring different uh, parts of the value chain. There is an, and different parts of the value chain deserve a specific method or a specific consideration to collect information on food uh, losses. It is not similar to collect information on food losses at the industrial level that collecting losses at the, at the farm level. Apart from that, there is the particularity of the commodities, okay? One thing is to collect data on food losses on grains and pulses that are not perishable. Another thing is to collect information on food losses on fruits and vegetables that are perishable. So all of these aspects made the measurement of food losses very particular, okay? We statisticians, we always say that measuring is difficult, but I think that food losses in agricultural statistics is the king or the queen, it doesn't matter how you want to tell it, of the things of, uh, of measurement uh, is quite uh, challenging. So we started to discuss that uh, in ICAS 2016, <coughs> and many ad uh, ad uh, advances, many, many, I mean we have done progress since then. So um, part of, I'm going to refer um, very briefly on these uh, specific points of progress. So first, the SDG, uh, a specific SDG indicator in order to m measure food loss uh, and ways have been endorsed by the UN Statistical uh, Commission. So the UN Statistical Commission uh, approved the existence actually of two different indicators, one that covers food loss, another one that covers food waste, okay? It was very important to make this distinction because in terms of policies, you have two different type of implications and the set of policies that you can think in order to tackle one issue or the other issue are different. So it was important to monitor these indicators in a separate way. In terms of custodianship, you know that every single SDG indicator has a, a UN agency that is custodian. So FAO has the custodianship of, food, of the food loss index, and that's the one that we are actually going to refer during, during this session and the presentations. But the food waste index is under the custodianship of UN Environment, UNEP. Um, what else? We have uh, made progress in terms of, of having a full uh, methodology, okay, in order to measure the food loss index, okay. We have developed guidelines for data collection of losses, uh, and we have tested those guidelines. So right now we have uh, we have available the world have available uh, guidelines to to collect uh, food losses on pulses and grains, also on meat and dairy products, also in vegetable and fruits, and finally on fish products. At least on those type of commodities, there is, uh, there is a specific uh, set of recommendations or, or, or guidelines in order to collect information on those, on those uh, food groups. Um, we have also uh, agreed on an operative definition to measure food losses, okay? Because uh, one thing that you may ask is, well, okay, so what is the difference between food losses and food waste? Where do we put the, the threshold, this specific line to try to differentiate what is one thing and what is the, the other thing? In the way that it has been um, uh, agreed, we're going to consider food losses, everything that goes uh, after uh, harvest up to the point, up to but excluding retail. Okay, so it's everything that happens after the harvest and before the retail, okay? In this sense, retail and the consumption that happens in households or uh, in public environments 
they are in the realm of the food waste index, okay? And uh, we still have to think, what do we do on the losses that, have, that happen at the, at the harvest uh, period, okay? Um, and well, also the losses that happen in the pre-harvest part. Um, we have also been able, uh, as FAO, to estimate uh, or to put together a food loss uh, model, okay, in order to be able to update the, 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 the figure, that figure that I was published in 2011 about the uh, state of food losses uh, in the world. So we managed to put together a, a, a model with all the information that is available, okay, on food losses, official and unofficial, okay? And we have been able to build a big data set of different estimates produced by countries. Doesn't matter which is their source or, or origin, and we have made that database available for everybody to use, okay? So you can visit uh, uh, our statistical portal of FAO and you will be able to download this data, okay, this data set that again was put together with this type of, uh, with this effort to measure at the global level. We were not interested to, to do it at the country level because of course we will be incurring a lot of errors, but at least on at the global level or regional level, what is the, what is the level of food losses? So we have estimated with this and that was uh, public, uh, published on the last SOFA report that is a uh, flagship publication of FAO it means the state of agriculture, that's the SOFA. The SOFA stands for state of agriculture in the world. And we have estimated that globally around 14% of the food uh, produced is lost, and there is dispersion among, uh, among regions. Um, uh, finally, we have already started working, or, or even without FAO, many countries have embarked in the implementation of post-harvest loss sample-based uh, surveys. So in that sense, the focus of this session is to give the word to countries, okay, and uh, in order to share the experience, the experience of this type of service that they have uh, put uh, together. This session aims at covering the whole value, uh, value, value chain, a variety, a variety of product groups, and a variety of, of regions. For that, we will have four presentations. We will start with <coughs> the presentation uh, of Emmanuel uh, Jofilisi. Uh, sorry if I not pronouncing, <laughs> uh, and I be not even there to, to pronounce the other one, but I will try. M. Wang Naletza, okay, of uh, Malawi. He's going to present to present uh, uh, a paper on measurement of, of post harvest losses in Malawi. Then we are going to continue with Nelly Georgieva of FAO re representing uh, Frank Kasha that couldn't come on a paper that uh, has the title of Measurement of Pre-Harvest Losses Due to Pest, a literature review and proposal of new assessment methods. Then we are going to go all the way to Mexico and we'll have the intervention of Jose Luis Hernandez Rodriguez that, uh, that is the head of agricultural statistics in the INEGI, uh, in the Institute of, uh, of Statistics and Geography of Mexico with a paper entitled Pilot Test on, on Estimation of Food Loss in Fruits and Vegetables, Mexico Experiences. And we are going to, f uh, to finalize in the United States. And we have a presentation of Linda, of Linda Cantor uh, with a paper entitled Update on Estimating Food Loss and Food Waste Along the U.S. Uh, Food Supply Chain. So let's uh, start. So I, I let me invite uh, Emmanuel uh, Joffi Lisi to come to the, to the podium. General comment, every single uh, presenter has around 15 minutes to do the presentation. Okay, Okay, thank you so much. Eh? I'm privileged to be the first speaker after the chair has opened. Um, I'm going to share with you our experience on the measurement of uh, post-harvest losses. Actually, it was a technical assistance 
provided by the global uh, strategy uh, with an aim of uh, building the capacity of the country in um, uh, generating reliable statistics for post harvest losses. This is the outline of the presentation. I will give a, a brief background to the TA that was provided to the country. Uh, objectives of the technical assistance, uh, activities undertaken uh, in the course of the project, some key results from the pilot study that was done, uh, some lessons learned, and the recommendations, and the status of each uh, recommendation. Um, Malawi actually developed the uh, SPARS, that's a strategic plan for statistics, um, as one of the building blocks of the uh, uh, NSS. Uh, the primary objectives of the strategy uh, is to guide the agricultural statistics subsector to improve the quality, accessibility, and time release of uh, agricultural statistics in the country. It was an excellent framework, of course, uh, with the well-defined areas uh, for development of statistics in the country. Uh, after we developed this pass, uh, it was very comprehensive. So what we did was to develop an action plan for implementing the SPARS. So we requested for technical support from FAO uh, to develop the action plan for the SPARS. And uh, five areas were identified to be prioritized in the implementation of the SPARS. One was improvements in the post harvest loss statistics generation. The second one was on the information management system and data bank. Then we had a third area which focused on the agricultural cost of production uh, statistics. The fourth one was on the food security surveillance. And lastly was the improvements on um, uh, crop estimates uh, survey. So we requested for technical assistance from the global strategy um, on PHL to respond to the first uh, <coughs> recommendation on the improvements of the post harvest losses. As I said, uh, the primary objective was to build the, the capacity of the country in generating uh, reliable statistics on post harvest losses uh, based on uh, reliable methodology. Specifically, uh, the TA strengthened the capacity of the national technical team in survey design, as well as the uh, training national team in data analysis. So we had the timelines of activities which were undertaken in the course of the uh, TA. But before that, we formed the national technical team, which was responsible for the over, overall coordination of the implementation of the activities. Members of the team were drawn from different institutions or stakeholders. We had members from the National Statistics Office, um, <laughs> some officers from FAO country office. We also had the uh, officers from Department of Research in the Ministry of Agriculture and the Department of Planning. So the, 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 the tier was provided uh, from 2017, that was around March, to around October uh, 2018. So this was the uh, timeline of the activities. Um, in March 2017, uh, the first mission came to Malawi to discuss with the national stakeholders and set up the technical uh, assistance plan. That was the first mission, and that what, what we achieved. Then in August 2017, uh, there was a training on concepts on post harvest losses and some definitions. And also, we looked at the questionnaire that was developed by the technical experts and have some inputs, define it. September 2017, we developed the manuals for the enumerators. Um, early January, uh, the following year, we trained enumerators on farmers' decoations approach. Um, in February 2018, we did data collection exercise uh, around March, data processing. Uh, April 2018, we trained uh, enumerators on fiscal measurements approach. September 2018, we trained national technical team in data analysis. And around October 2018, that's when we uh, developed the report. Let me mention that uh, the TA had, got, had two modules. The first module was uh, on um, losses reported by farmers. We called it a digression uh, module. 
And the second module had an element on objective assessment. So we had two modules uh, which were run, uh, which were, were implemented concurrently: objective measurement or physical measurements and the, uh, those losses are reported by farmers. So um, in the next few slides, I'm going to share with you some key um, results from the part study, which was done in four districts. Um, for losses divided uh, by farmers, um, you can see that overall, we had 13% for mm, men's local, uh, hybrid 14%, 22% for men's composite, uh, rice 16%, and gardeners 20%. So this is the overall uh, losses that were as reported by farmers. Um, we captured all the crops that are grown in the country, but since it was a pilot, we only focused on four uh, districts. Some crops were minor in those districts, so they didn't make sense in the analysis. That's why we removed them from the analysis. We just focused on the uh, three main crops in, in those areas. Um, Losses were captured at different stages. As you can see, we had losses measured uh, during harvesting, losses measured during threshing, cleaning, drying, and storage. So at each stage, we also measured the losses that the farmers experienced. So looking at the losses, that, that's according to the graph there, uh, you can see that uh, farmers experienced or reported higher losses during harvesting. Um, followed by threshing and the cleaning. Of course, we did not go further to ask you why they experienced uh, losses at these stages, um, higher losses at these stages, but uh, my understanding that uh, when we interviewed farmers, most of them, they used the manual method of harvesting. So that could be a, a, a reason for experiencing higher losses at harvesting. Use of machinery is very low. It's about uh, less than 2% of farmers use uh, machines. Uh, in, in harvesting and, uh, and other processing of uh, corn. So use of uh, uh, manual method of harvesting could be a, a reason for experiencing uh, higher losses at, um, at the harvesting. For the physical measurements, again, we can see that um, overall uh, groundnuts had 15.4% uh, of losses. Rice again, 16.4%. Uh, men's local 13.2, men's hybrid 12.8, and uh, men's composite uh, 15.1. So, again, yeah, the graph also shows that uh, the losses uh, were much higher at uh, harvesting as compared to other, uh, other stages. But overall, if you look at the losses by men's variety, we noted that the men's composite exp uh, the more losses as compared to, to uh, other uh, two uh, men's varieties. We, in this survey, we also asked farmers to report on the strategy that they use to prevent post-survey losses. And uh, majority of farmers reported uh, uh, harvesting on time as the best way of presenting uh, post-survey losses by proper shelling and the proper drying. So this is what farmers actually do to prevent post-survey losses. It's either it could be because of the past experience or maybe it's an application of the interventions on the uh, post-survey losses because farmers also taught how to, on how to prevent post-survey losses. So this is normally a farmer report that they do in order to uh, reduce post-survey losses. Um, most effective actions, according to farmers, what they think could be the most um, uh, uh, effective uh, actions for preventing post losses. Again, majority reported harvesting on, on time as, um, as, as one of the most effective actions to reduce post losses, uh, followed by proper drying and the proper sharing. Farmers were also uh, asked to, to, to report if they received any assistance from the uh, field staff. So looking at the results, it shows that um, slightly over half of the farmers that were interviewed reported that they received uh, technical assistance from the, from the field staff, from the extension officers. And 34.4% uh, of them said they also received uh, 
some uh, assistance on post-harvest losses. Uh, by, by region, that's what we see there, uh, Salim IGD has more farmers uh, reporting, receiving um, technical assistance, I mean, uh, assistance on post-harvest losses forwarded by the other uh, region there. So after the pilot, we drafted a report and came up with some recommendations. Uh, we had about four recommendations from the TA. The first recommendation was um, there was need to replicate the survey at national level to produce national and lower level estimates. Since this was a pilot, we needed to scale up the study and come up with um, a national uh, figures on post-harvest losses statistics. Second recommendation that I made uh, we believe that we know that uh, post survey losses can be caused by several factors, uh, such as weather variations. So a recommendation was made that uh, we need to establish a based on the data by conducting consecutively uh, similar study or same study for three years and have an average uh, figure for the losses so that we take into account in, uh, of our weather variations that might have experienced uh, in different uh, um, growing seasons. Uh, the third one was um, migrating from paper to copy. Uh, data processing was uh, a challenge. So there was a recommendation to migrate to uh, copy uh, from paper based data. Fourth one was um, integrating the, the PHL into new, into <coughs> existing national statistical system or data question systems because uh, making it as a standalone survey would be very expensive. So the best one was to uh, introduce a module in uh, one of the uh, national surveys that we conduct. So major lessons quickly, going through the major lessons, we learned uh, uh, quite a lot. One, data computation from the guidelines helped a lot. Uh, secondly, coverage of crops. Um, the physical measurement module also helped a lot. And the sampling strategy that we used in the pilot also uh, was a, a, one of the great lessons that we, we learned from the pilot. So this is the last slide. I've I said I've got two minutes, I'm, I'm on time, so, so. Um, after the recommendations, we try to look at each and recommendation and try to see how, how can we address uh, the recommendations. So the first recommendation was, as I said, was to replicate the study at national level. We did not do it uh, because uh, having it as a, a separate study would be very expensive. So what we did was um, to integrate it into the uh, IHS 4. So now we data collection is in progress and there's a module on post survey losses. So it's one of the modules in the current IHS, uh, which is um, uh, currently underway. Um, the second was to have, second recommendation was to have three surveys concurrent uh, in, in, in three years. So the first year, as I said that we have a module in the IHS. The recommendation was on CAPI, we requested for technical assistance from the African Development, Development Bank. So training on this copy that the survey solutions uh, has been done. We had two missions. So now we are ready to migrate into the use of copy in data questions. That marks the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, Emmanuel, by the way, is a principal statistician in the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation, and Water Development of Malawi. Okay, so now we move to the second uh, presentation that is going to be done by uh, Nelly Georgieva, but uh, she's representing uh, Frank Kasha, that is the main author of the, of the document, and unfortunately he cannot be presented. Just uh, very quick, Frank Kasha is a French statistician uh, economist. Um, he has extensive experience in conducting quantitative uh, projects on topics related to food and agriculture in both developed and developing countries. Uh, he is currently providing technical assistance on agricultural service to Costa Rica and Ecuador, and also serving as a consultant for uh, FAO uh, survey team. So Nelly, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much, Jose. Good morning, everybody. In fact, uh, it's very good that I will uh, <laughs> continue to present this paper. In fact, uh, Frank was <coughs> one of our consultants involved in the uh, technical assistance in Malawi for the post-harvest losses. 
and uh, he also worked in uh, many other countries under the, the framework of the global strategy for post-harvest losses. And uh, he tried also to widen a bit the scope of the food loss and to, um, to, to set a kind of a, um, literature review on what is available for another uh, um, type of food loss, which is pre-harvest loss. Uh, in fact, uh, in the slide that uh, Jose showed for the food loss and uh, food waste, probably you saw that the pre-harvest is not included into the food loss index. Um, because it, it, the pre-harvest loss is uh, the loss that uh, mainly due to um, pests and diseases is uh, what the loss occurring from the seeding to the harvest, prior to the harvest. Uh, so the post-harvest loss includes everything that goes after the harvest. Uh, so it's a good complement to the whole team of the food loss. And here, of course, the objective is not to undermine the uh, pre-harvest loss, but to complement the, the, the work done on pre-harvest losses from uh, the perspective of the post-harvest uh, uh, post losses from the perspective of uh, pre-harvest losses. So this is the content of the presentation you see here. I will try to be brief because the presentation is uh, um, a bit long and of course the, the paper that Frank prepared is uh, very uh, detailed. Um, the importance of pre-harvest losses you see here, there is a huge difference in the yield of the, ma the, the same crops in different regions. And um, for um, uh, one of the, the main reasons for these differences in the yield could be uh, the um, <coughs> diseases and pests that uh, deteriorate the quality and uh, reduce the quantity of the, uh, of the yield. Um, the importance of pre-harvest losses has been discussed in the international working groups and forums. Uh, however, uh, it, is, it is not in included as such in the, um, in, the, in the SDG indicator, but it does not mean that it's not important because it is very much reflected into the FAO strategic objectives. And the first uh, um, strategic objective of the FAO is uh, zero hunger challenge. It is also very well reflected in the Malabo Declaration where the African uh, head of state decided that it is time to take proper measures to halve the current levels of uh, uh, losses by the year 2025 and to improve the income of the uh, smallholders. This is um, uh, the Po, uh, food loss in the international agenda, in the sustainable development goals, it's under target 12.3. And the paper that is uh, uh, prepared by Frank and other colleagues <coughs> tries to propose a document to identify measurement frameworks as a starting for point for additional methodological work. Uh, here they try to uh, make a summary of um, methodological and research papers that are already available for the pre-harvest losses. And they try to propose a way forward to uh, improve the existing researches and existing methodologies. Uh, here on this slide you see the existing research at national level for the post-harvest losses on the left-hand side, hand, uh, left hand side and for the uh, pre-harvest losses. You see that for pre-harvest losses um, there are uh, quite a lot of researches but on um, very limited scale and uh, it is really for research purposes and for the pre-harvest losses the main challenge is how to aggregate these uh, research papers to country, region, and global level. Uh, 
Uh, what comes up from the uh, research at the international level is uh, measurement concepts and definitions are um, well developed. Uh, there are uh, definitions which are quite uh, similar between the researchers and also FAO because FAO has a publication from uh, 1983 on this subject. Uh, so the, um, the concepts and definitions that are uh, most used in the, in the literature review are minimum yield, potential yield, attainable yield and uh, uh, respectively minimum loss, potential loss, and actual loss. The procedures for individual studies which are experimental or research trials are also well developed and established, but uh, very often um, they are not very well um, documented with metadata and with explanation of uh, the um, nature of the research. A measurement framework for country and global estimates for the, for the moment is not well established. There are some methods that are proposed, but more and more, more, more work is needed in this direction. As I already Uh, mentioned uh, the main concepts and definitions you see here. These are minimum yield, actual yield, and attainable yield. The minimum yield is the yield that um, can be uh, obtained without any protection against uh, diseases and pests. Um, this minimum yield, of course, is uh, very often um, obtained and measured in a research environment or experimental environment. The attainable yield is the opposite. The attainable yield is the yield that could be obtained with uh, optimal protection measures. Again it, uh, again, it is an yield that can be produced in experimental or research environment. And these are the two theoretical concepts that are important after that for the uh, coefficients that uh, authors are uh, proposing to establish. The actual yield, this is the yield that we observed in the field. So this is the yield with the, measurement, the, the, the protection measures that the farmers are uh, taking. This is their yield that they either it is measured through objective measurement, crop cutting methods, or by declaration. And from here, we have the, the concept of actual loss, which is the maximum yield minus uh, actual yield and potential loss, which is the maximum yield minus minimum yield. That means the yield with full protection minus the yield with no protection. The potential loss and actual loss can be uh, uh, expressed in absolute or relative terms. Uh, some authors in the literature propose that uh, if it is in relative terms, it's better to be expressed as percentage of, at, uh, of attainable yield or of maximum yield. So these are the main concepts and definitions that are used after that in the uh, proposed methods. Uh, about the measurement method that are found in the literature, uh, most of the research papers um, speak about field trials with, of course, physical measurements. Because these are research papers and uh, uh, these are um, uh, limited fields that are observed, uh, it is possible and it is obligatory for these field trials to have physical measurements. Um, there are also uh, other uh, methods that are um, much less uh, uh, described in the literature. These are sample surveys. With the sample surveys, you can have also sample survey combined with physical measurement, or we, you can have sample survey combined with subjective measurement, that means farmer's declaration. And you can have also a mixed mode where uh, pictures with different stages of uh, damaged uh, crops are shown and uh, 
for each of these picture, percentage of loss is determined. And after that, the farmer say, my crop is attained uh, similarly to this picture, and then the percentage is automatically um, reflected into the questionnaire. And there is the third uh, method, it is focus groups. It is uh, for um, homogeneous small regions. Uh, there, is, um, there is no, um, let's say, individual um, questionnaire there. These are focus group by people that are knowledgeable in the field. This can be the, the head of the village plus uh, some uh, very important uh, agricultural producers or, uh, or uh, uh, re um, research officers or uh, extension officers here in the field and they, they discuss together on the subject. Um, again, here uh, the, the measurement method used is a subjective measurement because it is discussion or mixed approaches with uh, pictures. So now the main um, problem is how to uh, extrapolate the results uh, observed in the localized um, tra uh, area or trial uh, experimental fields to uh, country and to global uh, estimates. Um, because the, the difficulty here is that the pest infestation is localized and it is context specific and there are a lot of pests and there are a lot of crops and the combination between the pest and the crop is really specific to the region and to the country. And this is the, the difficulty how we extrapolate this from the field where the pest is uh, observed and the measures are observed, how we extrapolate this statistically with the sound statistical methods to, uh, to come up with country and global estimates. So the first thing uh, we as statisticians know very well, this is that first we need to, um, to choose the right statistical unit. And the right statistical unit depends on the purpose of our survey, depends on the context, depends on a lot of things. So there are three possibilities here. The first one is the field, a statistical unit. The second one is farm or farmer. And the third one is the village or farmer groups. If we choose the field, then it is almost 100% linked to, to physical or objective measurement. That means that we go on the field, there is a objective measurement that mean by agronomists or by extension officers on this field <coughs> or it's a really physical measurement uh, as it is specified in the, um, in the methodology of the survey. Okay, the other farmers can be declarative or, uh, uh, or physical and for uh, village and farmer groups, these are the focus group, it is always declarative. Uh, of course, here the sampling is very important. Um, the <coughs> uh, random sampling we, uh, um, we always use for uh, field and uh, farmers, farm and farmers uh, statistical unit, and uh, non-probabilistic sampling is used for village and farmer groups. And here, these are two examples for surveys and how to do global estimates. The second example, in fact, the sample survey plus physical measurement comes from India, and this is considered by FAO as a gold standard. And this is here, the field is the, uh, the statistical unit, and the sample is quite big, and part of the fields are left without any protection and other part of the field, all, all these fields are randomly selected. Part of them are without any protection. The other part is with the um, normal protection, let's say, and the other part is with the maximum protection. And then these coefficients are built. This is considered the gold standard. And it is uh, uh, well explained in the file publication from 83. You see the reference there. 
Uh, the other example is uh, where we just go and interview farmers with uh, specific targeted questions, and this is uh, by farmer declaration. Um, here for the extrapolation, we use the usual statistical practices for uh, extrapolation depending on the sample. Um, the problem with the second example, which is considered gold standard, is because uh, the sample should be quite big, the survey is quite expensive and it needs um, very, uh, very skilled professionals to go to, the, uh, to, this, uh, to do this physical measurement. Uh, the third method explained in the literature is a combination between uh, literature or theoretical percentages and available aggregates, for example, Faustad, uh, where there are data at country level for uh, yield of crops. And this is one example of a method that is uh, well described by Orke in uh, 94. Uh, by uh, by um, experimental trials and literature review, the coefficients of actual and potential losses are uh, calculated, and then by applying these coefficients through the aggregated data on crop production that comes from Faustat, uh, we uh, come up with the final indicators on potential losses and actual losses. This experiment is uh, this methodology is really very interesting. Unfortunately, there is no time to, uh, uh, to present it at length. <laughs> okay, uh, um, um, one minute, I'm sorry. But uh, you see here the, the pluses and uh, the pros and cons of this uh, method. Uh, the problem is that uh, for the file stat is file stat. It is well developed, ev everybody has access, it is well explained, there is no problem. The problem with, with, is with uh, the establishment of the coefficients in the phase one, the percentages, theoretical percentages, it comes from uh, research reviews and experimental trials and uh, sometimes the, the method uh, again, behind these experimental trials is not very transparent. So this is one of the field that needs to be further developed. Uh, just to see global estimates, some results that are found in the literature, you see that in the 70s, um, the, the losses were about 13%. Uh, After that, they came up quite significantly, and this is uh, due to the mono monoculture, the intensification, and these kind of things, and after that, uh, the trend is uh, the opposite. The losses uh, tend to decrease a bit. Uh, so uh, here, just I want to say, to conclude, that there is still a room for improving the, uh, the methodology as uh, it is find in the, in, found in the literature review. Uh, there are uh, countries, you see here some example, that are already doing some um, um, activities, are having some, uh, some activities in this direction. And uh, we think that uh, more methodological work is, is necessary to improve this uh, very important uh, topic of pre-harvest losses at global level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nelly, and also thank to Frank. Um, she has been able to uh, allow us to navigate into the, the world of the methods in, uh, to measure uh, pre-harvest uh, losses. So now we are going to give the floor to Jose Luis uh, Hernandez uh, Rodriguez. In the Spanish tradition, we have two names and two last names, so that's why it's so long. He's, a, he's an engineer in agronomy, working for the Mexican National Institute for Statistics and Geography, so. INEGI. Uh, and he is uh, currently the coordinator for information processing and is responsible for the data validation and analysis in all agricultural statistic projects uh, in INEGI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, well, you can call me simply Jose. It's, it's easy. Um, 
sound like the Mexican soap opera? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, um, I, I am going to, to, to share you the, our experiences in the pilot test on estimation of uh, food loss in fruits and vegetables. Um, so I can. This uh, pilot test uh, was uh, conducted in the context of the, of the, of the 12 uh, SDG. And the, and the goal 12.3 uh, that says by 2030, health per capita global food waste at the retail and consumer levels and reduce food losses along the production and supply chain, including post-harvest. Uh, and uh, specifically, this uh, uh, pilot test was uh, focused on the food losses index, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, Jose said. Uh, this uh, pilot test was conducted in collaboration with FAO, ICAR, and INEGI. Uh, Indian Council of Agricultural Research uh, uh, provided us the methodology for this pilot test and uh, gave us the training. Uh, FAO uh, uh, was responsible for designing the questionnaire, gave us the technical uh, support, uh, even during field operation and uh, uh, help us to the log logistical support through the uh, FAO uh, Mexico, Office Mexico. And INEGI was responsible for select the areas uh, uh, where the, the pilot tests uh, were carrying out. Um, INEGI was uh, responsible also for uh, sample selection, um, for select the products and uh, the most important for the field operation. Uh, this uh, uh, pilot test was focused on the losses that can occur in all operation in every part of the supply chain, as uh, harvest, uh, collection, classification, cleaning, packing, transportation, storage, and commercialization. And we visited different actors of the value chain, producer, transporter, warehouses, wall sellers, and retailers. Uh, this pilot test was designed into uh, following, uh, well, following the methodology, this pilot test was carried out using two methods. Uh, a survey uh, in which uh, we applied the questionnaire to the actors of the value chain, producers, wholesalers, and retailers. And the other method was to physical or real measurement. Uh, in this case, we uh, made a random selection of a small plot on the harvesting area, and the harvested product was classified classified separating from good product uh, uh, to the bad product and then uh, both were weighted. And of course we had a, a planning, it was to, to take her to select the area and ensure that during the test selected areas were in harvesting stage. This was very important. We selected a municipality in, in two states of the country. All of these uh, 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 activities were uh, in coordination with FAO and ICAR staff. For the selection crop, it was established as a requirement that the crop had to be harvested season and that one fruit and uh, one vegetable was chosen. Um, in this case, we uh, selected banana in case of fruit and uh, for vegetables, we selected uh, broccoli. Also, we had the, uh, the training. We as I said, uh, provided by the, by the uh, personnel of ICAR. Uh, we had uh, 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 room uh, training and field training. Uh, in case of survey, well, a field, uh, we have a field uh, uh, operative during September 2018. Uh, to the survey, we uh, uh, integrate a directory of uh, producers and we visited uh, the, the, the actors of the value chain directly uh, at their home or workplaces to apply the questionnaire. Uh, in case of the questionnaires that we applied in, in, in the survey, we, we uh, collect information from losses, losses during the harvest and post-harvest, during the commercialization and, and transportation and storage. These uh, questionnaires were applied for uh, to the producers, the wholesaler, retailer, and transporters. Uh, in case of uh, uh, physical or real measurement, we uh, 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 make a, 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 
a sweep of the area that uh, we carry out the, the, the pilot test to identify the producing harvesting at the moment uh, 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 where we are on the uh, field activities. And we went di directly to the fields accompanied by the producer to select the small plot where the actual measure measurement would be made. As you can see in these uh, photos, we select a, a, a small plot, uh, we harvest the, the, the product and uh, weigh, the, weigh the, the product. Separated, as I said, bad for good. And <coughs> it's important to, to, to mention that uh, to, to access the, the, the area, uh, uh, we, we, we um, uh, had to, to, to accomplish uh, uh, different, well, the rules uh, imposed by the producers, uh, as you can see, we had to cover the, 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 the head, the cover the, the hands and the, and the mouth to, to try to avoid the getting touch with the, with the product. Uh, in this case, we apply the questionnaires also to, to collect uh, losses during harvest and uh, uh, during harvest and po post harvest and during the commercialization, transportation and storage. But in this case, the, the questionnaires were filled by the, by the personal of the Institute of Inecti. Um, the conclusions, the conclusion, uh, in case of conclusion, I, I, re I highlight that uh, uh, my conclusion are uh, focused in the operative and um, uh, and uh, conceptual aspect beyond the the, the quantitative results. Uh, the first conclusion is uh, that it is necessary to clearly define the boundary between pre-harvest and harvest and po post-harvest losses. This is very important because uh, uh, sometimes when we ask the inform the, the information to the producer, uh, they try tend to to give us the information uh, uh, that occur uh, in pre-harvest. Uh, uh, this uh, is a, a natural uh, answer from the, from the producer, so we need to take care uh, to collect informa this information. It's very, very important. Uh, in real measurement, there must be an accurate synchronization with the producer to attend the day and time when the producer is being harvested which could be complicated in a real survey because uh, we need to, to, to coincide the time and day when the producer are harvesting the products to, to make, the, make the real measurement. Uh, it can be difficult to locate uh, some actors in the value chains as a wall seller, retailer, transport, some of the others because we, we start with a, with a directory of producers but uh, the, the the rest of the of the of the directories uh, uh, are building during the during the test because we can not identify at the at the beginning the wholesaler or the retailers. We need to ask for the producers who sell the products and to identify the rest of the actors of the value chain before starting the collection of information. The marketing channels of the crops and their studies should be well identified. As Jose said at the beginning, we need identify. <coughs> What is the what is the, 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 the commercialization channel that goes every product? If we don't know that, we don't know identify the actors who participate in that uh, in that uh, value chain. It's uh, uh, every product has a different uh, <coughs> channels of con commercialization. Uh, well, in case of uh, some countries, in case of Mexico, the intermediaries of middlemen must be considered as an important player of the participation in the value chain because uh, they, the, uh, this uh, uh, actor uh, play a very important role in the commercialization of the, of the products. In case of wholesaler, retailers, and transporters, the directory must be integrated, as I said, during the field work. It is complex to, col to collect losses at uh, of farm transportation. I, I, I tell you that uh, during this test, literally, we had to to hunting the transporters to, to collect the information. In case, well, in case of retailers, uh, we had to, to go to the markets and the small stores uh, where uh, selling fruits and vegetables. We don't know, uh, we don't have any problem to, to collect information with these uh, actors. And it is necessary to define full losses related with the processing, as 
as I, as uh, Jose said also, it's very important that uh, the processing of the of the produce, uh, mainly the fruits and vegetables. So this is very important to consider the process the losses on the processing uh, by the industry because uh, many products uh, uh, follow this uh, this uh, 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 commercialization channel. And that one's uh, to the feed cattle, uh, it's uh, important also to define if, for example, if the product is, uh, uh, if, the, if the losses uh, is destined to the feed, ca uh, to the feed cattle, uh, should be considered as a, as a loss or shouldn't be considered as a loss? Well, this is the question. It is important to specify and clarify to the producer about the reference period considered in the survey to avoid collecting information from the other harvests made during the year. It is important to, to, to clarify the, the, to the producer that we are uh, asking for the information only for that, uh, only for that harvest, not for, for the period har harvest. For, for example, in case, of, in case of broccoli, we have uh, uh, more than one harvest during the year. So it, it is important to uh, specify that we are uh, that we are uh, uh, collecting information about the about the uh, current harvest. Well, uh, now we have a a, 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 a strategic methodology for the for the uh, <coughs> index 12.31, and now we are to to encourage the the, the, the countries to produce data. In case of, of uh, our, my country, we have identified different efforts to measure full losses and waste uh, made by FAO and the Ministry of Agriculture uh, and a project launched by the, by the government, which the name is the National Crusade Against Hunger, uh, efforts made uh, by the World Bank and, and the <coughs> Ministry of, of uh, Environmental. Uh, in ECI, through the National Agricultural Survey, this is some of examples that uh, we we um, uh, have been uh, made in the in the country, as I said, FAO with the Ministry of Agriculture in a study to with uh, corn, beans, and tomato. Those are the the, the results. Uh, and other efforts by the made by the as I said by the by the World Bank, uh, National Crusade about the hunger, uh, and this is the the result that we obtained from the from the. Uh, National Agricultural Survey in 2017. Um, in this case, we insert a, a question only as a part of the of the of the uh, destination of the production. But now, in the National Agricultural Survey 2017, that is carrying out uh, now, uh, we have included an as an, uh, an a question specifically to uh, to, to collect information about the about the loss and about through the uh, uh, direct question <coughs> to the producer and uh, to collect information about how many kilograms did, did they lose. Uh, but, uh, but also the, the causes for the, for the losses. Um, thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, uh, Luis. You have made uh, important points that I will summarize at the end of the, of the presentation. So, uh, but any, anyway, your presentation um, gives me some grounds as well to, to acknowledge the work that uh, YASRI has done in order to develop the methodology that we have uh, now available to support countries to collect uh, food losses. So you have to be aware that uh, India has a well-established system to collect uh, uh, losses, post-harvest losses. Uh, and uh, it was very key to observe that and to listen to that on the previous edition of uh, of the ICAS event uh, in which we in which they presented the work that they that they that they have done. Okay, so let's move on. Now we have the last of our uh, presenters. Uh, that's Linda Candor. Uh, in the meantime that she put her presentation, I'm going to introduce her. So Linda is an agricultural economist at the Economics uh, Research Center of the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture. She has uh, a long practice with food losses and recently rejoined the crop branch at ERS. 
So Linda, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, as Jose said, we've been measuring food loss at ERS since 1997, and I was involved in some of those early efforts. Uh, there are a couple other people that I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, Jean Busby has done a lot of the pioneering work in this area in our agency. She's on temporary assignment uh, to another federal agency, so I'm filling in for her. And I'd also like to acknowledge two of my colleagues in our crops branch, I'm in the food economics division, who have done some preliminary work on on-farm on level losses, and I'll talk about some of those efforts at the end. Uh, first, I'll talk about, some, uh, give some background on the ERS food loss methodology and talk about our definition of food loss, which is different from the FAO food loss index definition, and then talk about our uh, recent initiatives on consumer level loss, retail level loss, and our a new work on farm level loss. Um, in the context of SDG 12.3, the USDA and Environmental Protection Agency in 2015 launched the U.S. Food Waste Challenge, and it's a multifaceted approach trying to encourage uh, food loss reduction and at the same time recovery and reuse. And you can see the different um, aspects of the challenge. It looks at consumer education, school meals, connecting with charitable groups. And in red here, one of the main um, calls was to update and improve estimates of food loss in the United States. So again, in 20, for 2019-2020, there's been a new federal interagency strategy um, working with the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the Food and, Ag and, Food and Drug Administration to improve interagency court. Oh. It's not, it's not advancing. It's advancing, it's advancing here, but not there. Oh, okay. No? Yeah, I'm sorry, I've been talking and not realizing that. Ah, but probably it's because it's not in presentation mm -hmm. mode. I didn't realize that the slides weren't advancing. That will add in for her. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Let's try it, let's try it again and let's see. Yes. It is there, but then it will move. Yes. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. So. All right. Uh, let's see, where was I? Here we go. Okay. The federal interagency strategy um, to encourage uh, food waste and uh, food recovery and to reduce food loss. And there are several different facets of that, improving interagency coordination, consumer education and outreach, um, guidance on food loss waste measurement, food safety and date labels, and some others. And I will, I'll, in, in the, um, consideration of time, I'll keep going. Now, ERS defines food loss as the edible, edible amount of food post-harvest available for humans' consumption but not consumed for any reason. And we consider food waste to be a subset of that definition. Uh, so we do count post-harvest loss um, <coughs> as food loss rather than food waste. Food waste would be plate, plate scrapings and, and things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, as I said, we've been estimating food loss since 1997 and in the context of our larger efforts on measuring food availability, the amount of food available for consumption in the, in the U.S. food supply. And that's a balance sheet approach where we start with supply, which is a sum of beginning stocks, um, production and imports. We subtract exports, other uses, and ending stocks, and we come up with domestic availability, and we measure that on a per capita basis. Now, our loss-adjusted estimates start with a primary production level, starts where that, that data series ends. 
and we have estimated that annually for, for since 1970. Okay. And we, as I said, we measure three aspects of loss, loss from the primary to retail level, losses at the retail level, and losses at the consumer level. Now the primary to retail level data encompasses things like bones removed from animal carcasses, um, changes in, in weight due to moving from a farm level product for broccoli, for example, to a frozen product. And many, it's important to note that many of these factors, particularly in the primary to retail level, date back from a famous publication that we have at the USDA from 1975. And we haven't really updated a lot of those, unfortunately, factors since then. Our main work has been concentrated in updating the retail and consumer level losses. It's also important to note that although this is an annual series, as I said, we have data from 1970 onward to 2017. It's important to note that the loss factors are not updated annually. As you can imagine, it's a very expensive data intensive process to derive any of the loss factors. So I'm gonna talk about um, again, the, um, the food availability data is our core data set and the food loss is derived from that and we measure the amount of food loss, calories, the value, and we also measure it in food pattern equivalents, which is another word for servings and that allows us to measure food losses and food intake against the dietary guidelines. Now we consider, again, we consider the, our food loss estimates a work in progress, so that estimates are preliminary and we've had a number of initiatives led by Dr. Busby over the years to improve these data. And I'm gonna talk about um, a couple of those today. Since 2009, we've done um, two estimates of supermarket losses. We've done two estimates of consumer level losses. We've reached out to the Nat National Academies of Science to look at our methodology, and we, we had a day-long workshop about <clears throat> on that. And then we also convened an expert academic panel to look at some of the strengths and weaknesses in our data set and make recommendations for improvement. So today I'm going to talk about the um, most recent efforts on consumer level loss and supermarket and retail loss. Our consumer level loss estimates are derived using uh, an approach that um, compares purchases with intake. Now we've just updated this data using what we call our National Household Food Acquisition and Purchase Survey, known as Food Apps, which is a sample of about 4,000 households and where the households report everything they acquire, purchases in the supermarkets, food away from home, food they receive for free from charitable institutions or even neighbors, and we compare that to individual intake data reported in the NHANES What We Eat in America, our National Food Consumption Survey. And um, right now, that data is, uh, those estimates are undergoing review and we're using a modeling approach. We have a cooperator from Penn State University who's trying to validate those estimates using an, uh, some, a new approach. And I won't go into the details of that, but if you want more information, I can provide that to you. And we're very excited about a new um, primary data collection effort in the retail sector. Now our retail estimates are a weak, have been a weak link in our lost data series. We haven't really updated those data since the series was created back in 1997. And um, again, the approach is to collect shipment and sales data from food retailers, and then the difference between those would be considered the loss rate. So we're very excited. We're in negotiations with the Census Bureau to piggyback on one of their existing mandate, mandatory surveys of um, businesses to uh, request this, this data, and it's just, we're very excited to um, use their expanded sample frame and um, make sure that we include multiple sizes of retailers from the very small retailer to the very large corporations. And as you can imagine, there's been some concern about 
whether or not retailers would provide this type of proprietary data that's considered really trade secret data to the government. But um, by going through the Census Bureau and having attaching our survey to a mandatory collection, we avoid some of those privacy concerns and increase our response rate. We'll also in be including a short survey on the drivers of food loss um, at the retail level. And that data will include all commodities except fresh fruits and vegetables, which we included in some of our earlier surveys. So we're very excited to have there, meat, poultry, dairy, seafood, frozen fruits and vegetables, and non-perishable items. And we've received some feedback from some of our um, private sector um, collaborators that some of the data may be, especially on meat and poultry and dairy, may be out of date. And so we're really excited to collect some new data on that. And those, those results should be available by about 2023, we're hoping. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is our new work on the farm, le farm level loss. We had a request from Congress. Congress noticed that USDA had been doing a lot of work on consumer and retail, but there was very little data available on on-level farm losses. So they made a request to the Economic Research Service to do some um, work on in this area and um, to um, provide some new estimates on farm level loss, to look, identify new markets for cosmetically imperfect food, and look for value-added opportunities for producers. And they asked ERS to um, quantify the and types of produce wasted on farms, barriers to recovery, and new market opportunities. Um, so ERS decided because we're an economic research service, we decided to start with a um, qualitative analysis, and this is our conceptual framework. We wanted to look at the underlying economic drivers and causes, causes of on-farm on level food loss. And uh, we decided to focus on fruits and vegetables because of their highly perishable nature. They're very important to diet quality, obviously, and illustrate many of the challenges surrounding food loss of other items. And there's evidence that a large portion of food loss on the farm is in the pre-retail supply chains. So I'll talk a little bit about how the study was conducted. We first um, initiated a workshop where we brought together a different um, interested parties from academia, industry, and producer organizations to identify what are some of the key um, key issues that we should look at in conducting a study like this. We brought on collaborators from four different universities who undertook case studies of fresh field tomatoes, processing tomatoes, potatoes, strawberries, romaine lettuce, and peaches. And our preliminary outputs were a journal article in the journal Choices, which took a look at some of the economic drivers of food loss on the farm, and there's a forthcoming book which will provide more detail, and that should be, we expect that out in January. Okay. And as I said, um, there's data that food loss in fruits and vegetables, that a large share of it occurs in the pre-retail stages, and there's very little data to date on that. These are, um, one of the main drivers of uh, produce loss on the farm is price volatility. Either the prices are too low to make harvesting economical, or prices are high, resulting in substandard um, produce going onto the market and pushing loss perhaps later into the supply chain, into the retail sector, even the household sector. And another important driver that we identified through the case studies and literature review were, of course, um, labor costs and availability, where this chart shows that um, the change over time and the availability of farm labor and um, producers have to compete at peak harvest times for the amount of labor available. I'll just go through these very quickly. And then um, supply chain constraints. You can see, I'm sorry you can't really see a lot of the detail on this chart, but it shows the complexity of the supply changes for fruits and vegetables and how many times 
hands, hands touch the product, how many opportunities there are for loss, how many opportunities there are for recovery, as Jose was already talked about. And uh, so we tried through the study, tried to identify what some of those key supply constraints were. And you can see one of, one of the major con um, supply constraints are standards and expectations, and this is an example of, for tomatoes. And um, for USDA, for example, has 20 different uh, marketing orders for fresh produce, and I'm not sure if you're all familiar with that, but they set um, criteria, the marketing order set criteria for appearance, gives growers and um, buyers a common language for talking about um, <coughs> standards of produce, and this can lead to a lot of um, loss where producers don't want to bring this to the market and buyers don't want to present it to a consumer because in other countries this is true, but in the U.S., I mean, consumers are very, very used to having their perfect apples and their perfect tomatoes, and um, uh, retailers, of course, want to meet those expectations. So again, um, as Jose was saying, the fruits and vegetables, not only, but all, all agricultural commodities are heterogeneous products, and there's not one size fits all for measuring loss across the supply chain or for any particular group of products. The markets are highly complex. We need better data and a better understanding of market dynamics, the, especially the drivers of loss in all the different sectors to, to better understand food loss and com be able to even begin to estimate and come up with a number for these sectors. I hope I stayed within the time. Are there any questions? No, no, it's, um, it's, it's perfect. Yes, but l just to organize the, the thing, so we are going to make questions for all the presenters at the same time because we don't have time to correct it by, by presenter. So please refer to any one of the presenters at the moment that you are making the, the question. So we are going to probably be able to take three, four questions. So uh, I have a question there. And please, if you have a question, raise your hand. <coughs> this is about post-harvest losses. I am H.S. Sharma. I, there is a high ambient temperature in Indian, high relative humidity, no cold chain, and 20% peak power shortage. What is the result? 100 kilogram fruit, vegetable we grow, 80 kilogram goes to waste. So there is a national task force on perishable agriculture commodity, Government of India, <coughs> Ministry of Agriculture, of which I was a member. I was trained across the world. I was sent to Holland, Wageningen, by food irradiation, you can stop sprouting of potatoes and onions. So I want to know what exactly is done in Mexico and US on food irradiation. This was a big topic that if you irradiate by cobalt 60, you will stop sprouting of potatoes, onions. If you want to export, it must be irradiated. There are half a dozen advantages of food irradiation. Now there has been no mention anywhere here on what is the status in Mexico what is the status in U.S.? Is it allowed or banned or what? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We are collecting more questions, please. Don't be shy. Yes, please. Okay. Here and after we have a question here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sriram. Uh, first of all, uh, I, c I want to congratulate all the present uh, presenters. Uh, they are a wonderful set of presentations. Uh, for, uh, we actually worked in one of the food loss assessment studies that happened in India. In Sorry, can you speak a little bit louder sure, because sure. I cannot. We actually worked uh, in one of the food loss assessment study uh, in 2016, I, I, I think. So uh, compared to the methodology employed by FAO and by USDA, I see uh, in the methodology uh, of USDA, there is a nutritional component that is involved, the dietary, uh, the dietary recommendations for the country. Uh, I, w I just want to know, is there any significant difference in loss estimation when dietary guidelines were included versus the standard food loss uh, assessment by FAO? No, thank you. Thank you for your question. We have another question here. Hi, I'm Prachi Vincent. My question is that uh, what about the harvest losses that occur due to any natural calamity like floods, etc.? 
are these accounted for when we calculate uh, post-harvest losses for these indicators? Thank you. Can, can, can you repeat your question, please? Um, my question is that what happens to the losses that occur on account of floods or any other natural calamity? Are these ah. accounted for, in, or we just take the uh, harvest losses that, d that are in the normal operation of the crop? Thank you. Probably one more question, if there is any other question, and then we will give the floor to our presenters. Okay, please. Namaste, myself Padma Pohrel. I am from Agriculture Ministry, Nepal. Uh, I have one query about the Mex about the Mexican scientists about food loss because we are we have just accomplished our work about food loss in Nepal uh, field for, as a piloting uh, technical support from FAO uh, Bangkok and the, the field work is just finished. Then data data. Um, data entry and reporting is now pro processing. I have one query about a uh, Mexican scientist, uh, if, uh, about his experience. Uh, what, is the ex uh, what is the exact uh, sample size of in the Mexican? Uh, it was piloting, I, I think it was piloting in the Mexican, Mexico. What is actual uh, sample size? And then is there is uh, losses by paste? Uh, is is account, um, is accounted accounted or not in Mexico? It is my queries. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to give the floor to the to the presenters. So I will start with uh, with uh, Malawi. Do you do you want to respond to some of the to some of the points? There was not a specific question for you, as it, as it was probably not, but if you have any kind of general uh, comment, you can go. Otherwise, okay. Is, is there any microphone, or they have to come here? Ah, okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. I think there was a question. <coughs> losses from the natural disasters. Um, of course, uh, if you look at the guidelines, they're actually focusing on the normal operations. But it depends on at what stage is the natural disaster occurring. If it is occurring at the storage stage, then it must be included at that particular stage when you're doing the, when you measure the losses. So if the losses are occurring at pre-harvest, so when you are estimating losses at that particular stage, they must also be included in the, in the analysis. Uh, Nelly, please. Um, okay, Jose Luis. Thank you. Um, as uh, I said in my presentation, um, uh, uh, we uh, carried out this uh, pilot test, but uh, uh, most of our uh, activities were um, focused on the operative and and uh, uh, problematic aspects during the the uh, fields operation. Uh, most of the information were sent to the uh, FAO Rome, and they analyze and process data and. Uh, that is the reason because I, I didn't mention uh, uh, numeric results. And uh, uh, otherwise, we are starting to collect information. Really, we are starting to collect information at uh, producer level in the National Agricultural Survey. Uh, as I said, also, uh, there are uh, some studies made by other institutions, like the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, and uh, they have made some studies speci specific f from uh, uh, study cases uh, and specific uh, um, products. But in case of INEGI, really uh, sorry, because we are starting to collect uh, data about this uh, topic. 
Linda, you have the floor. In terms of food irradiation, I don't know a lot about it, but it, my understanding is there's very been very low consumer acceptance in the U.S. for irradiated foods, and I think there is some irradiation allowed for certain spices, but not beyond that that I'm aware of. Um, it, in terms of the dietary guidelines, I don't know if I'm com I was completely clear about that. Um, our food availability data is really considered an upper bound on the <coughs> amount of uh, food and calories available in the food supply. And then the individual intake data, which is collected by another part of our agency, is kind of considered the lower bound. And we, adjust, we try to get closer to actual individual intake by adjusting our food availability data for losses. And that's where we develop the loss adjusted food availability. So we do compare the food pattern equivalents or the servings that we derive from the loss adjusted food availability data. We use that to compare to dietary guideline recommendations by food group. And then we, com we can also use that as a benchmark to compare the, against the individual intake data. And the benefit of our data set versus the individual intake data is that it's a long-term time series. The food availability data goes back to 1909 for some commodities. As I said, we have the LAFA series back to 1970. The individual intake data called What We Eat in America, that's collected on a um, biannual cycle with 5,000 households. So it gives us a different set of benchmarks within the U.S. to look at what people are eating. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, for sake of time, I think that we're going to close this, uh, this session. Um, uh, let me just uh, make a very quick summary. So first, I think that there is a high level of consensus from the point of view of everybody in agreeing about the difficulty of measuring uh, uh, food losses. Uh, I remember uh, seeing the description of the value chain of maize in, in Mexico and it was bigger than the one that you presented. It was an A3 page, uh, and there was not a single place that th th they had not a specific uh, a unit or graph or uh, agent that was not participating in the, in, the, in, in the value chain. But there is also consensus on the importance of measuring it, okay? We know that a reduction of food losses is not just that we are saying that it's a sustainable development goal, but it has an importance uh, per se. It has several implications in terms of food security, and especially a uh, huge importance in terms of the, of the environment because of the implications that, that it has of losing something that was basically destined to feed uh, human beings. Uh, we have, uh, there have been several points. One of the points that I would like to, to give as a key message is to clearly define the boundaries between what is pre-harvest, harvest, and post-harvest losses, okay? So I said in my introduction that we, as FAO, we had to determine some kind of operational uh, definition of these three uh, segments. But as you can see, different, uh, different studies and different countries uh, treat these type of concepts in a different way. So we need to, to clarify and agree on these, on these type of concepts. Second important of studying the market dynamics. Okay? You mentioned it as market uh, channels, you mentioned it as, as market uh, dynamics of the crops. It has to be well understood before going to make this type of, uh, of studies. Then that we still need some methodological research for especially specific components of the, uh, of the value chain. Especially here I'm going to refer about processing and the industrial uh, part. There is still uh, some uh, quite uh, research that we have to do in order to be able to recommend countries how uh, that type of losses have to be measured in that specific part of the of the of the value chain. With that, I would like to thank the presenters. Okay, please, can we give them a, a round of applause? <laughs> and of course, all of you for attending this meeting. Hopefully, I see you in the next ICAS when we'll have the third meeting on food losses. Okay, <laughs> bye. I just take the opportunity to thank the chair, Jose Rosara Mancayo, for successfully conducting the session. I have an announcement to make. Uh, the lunch will be uh, served on swimming, uh, swimming pool lawn and hard court area adjacent to convention hall. Yes. Okay, so by the pool.
Yeah, right? Okay, sir. Okay, you ask for the Thank food, you. you cannot miss it. Enjoy the lunch. Okay.